Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Gaming Citycom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to start things out with Zen 3 news concerning the memory controller of Zen 3, because we will see support for both DDR4 and DDR5 memory. But after that, we're going to move over to Zen 2. Zen 2, of course, will be the heart of the Epic Roam processors as well as Ryzen 3000 because we have information concerning the IPC gains of the Zen 2 microarchitecture and they are very impressive indeed. For those wondering what's going on in the background, I'm in the process of handling a review, which is an RTX 2070. This is a gaming Z variant from MSI. The temperatures of this thing are actually really good. It's hitting around the 60 uh, degrees mark and so far the core is rock stable at uh, like 1950 megahertz without any tweaking at all. I've not tweaked the fan profile, I've not improved, uh, so increased the power limits. It's really good. So that will be an upcoming review uh, on the channel over the next few days. I'm finishing the last tests of that now. Just in case you're wondering what's going on in the background, because this video is somewhat impromptu because all of this news just come up and I was like, ah, I'm trying to do reviews. <laughs> what's going on? Help me. Uh, anyway, so let's start things out with the Zen 3 news first, because it's by far the quickest of the two pieces of news to go through. So this information has been leaked through Bits and Chips, uh, their Twitter account, and I'm going to read this verbatim. Thanks to chip the design, we can have two Zen 3 AM4 lines, one with DDR4 uh, IMC and one with DDR5 IMC. The same x86 core die, different I.O. controller, the AM4 uh, will have a long life socket. So obviously what he means by that, or whomever put this out, uh, is that the actual processor core will remain consistent. So they're not gonna have a different layout necessarily of the CPU core. But what it does mean is that the actual memory controller inside of the processor will differ depending on whether they're targeting DDR4 or DDR5. Obviously DDR5 will have higher bandwidth. And there's a couple of reasons that that could be rather interesting. The first is the simple answer, faster memory equals more data to the CPU cores, which if we do see a bumped uh, core count for Zen 3, just for clarity's sake, Zen 3 follows Zen 2. So Zen 3 is still gonna be on a 7NM process, but it's gonna be 7NM plus. And supposedly there are gonna be some tweaks, but AMD have not told us exactly what they're doing. So they've not said whether we're gonna see increased core counts over the uh, Zen 2 architecture. They've not said if they have engraved a, you know, an image of the turtle on the die. We just don't know. But what is abundantly clear is that DDR5 is obviously going to increase the bandwidth for the chip, but it also brings a couple of other options. One of the biggest uh, and most obvious things that AMD can do, from what we're hearing about Navi, is it's also going to follow a chiplet design. So what we could see here is the amalgamation of all of these to uh, technologies, the combination of DDR5, a some number of processor cores, let's say for the sake of this video, eight processor cores, let's just go with the number we know, and Navi. And that could be a next generation APU, which AMD releases, let's say in 2020. Or we could see an improvement, like we could have Navi Pass, we could have uh, some other GPU technology, which is specifically designed for this uh, technology. This could also be inspired by the PlayStation 5's APU as well. I'm not saying the PlayStation 5 or the next generation Xbox use Zen 3. What I am saying is that it could have been perhaps some of the tweaks they've made for another variant of Zen and uh, Navi, which that's the rumor the PlayStation 5 is using, so it could be inspired by that. Either way, of course, DDR5 eventually is going to be coming to desktops anyway, so it's going to be very interesting to see exactly what AMD can do with this. It's going to have a lot of performance advantages. It's going to be absolutely phenomenal as well, uh, of maybe not on the AM4 socket, but a variant of that socket, whatever that might be for laptops. There's a lot of different options there. And for... Uh, consumers who don't necessarily want to do a whole bunch of gaming. They don't necessarily need a discrete graphics card, but let's say by the year 2019, late 2019, 2020, when this thing starts to uh, you know, see rumors of release, even if we were to have performance of, let's say, a GTX 1080 or a 1080 Ti, which isn't 
necessarily out of the question of an APU that's going to be released in two years time with a new architecture with presumably much faster clock speeds and so on. That would be a pretty nice gaming uh, GP APU, even if they managed, let's say, a uh, Vega 56 or a 1070 kind of performance. Obviously, we don't have enough information here, so it's pure hypothesis on my part. But even if they don't do an APU, the move to DDR5 memory will drastically improve bandwidth. Of course, it's most likely that we're going to see new motherboards released, whether we're going to have the ability to plug in uh, let's say a Zen 3 uh, CPU in a current generation motherboard, let's say like the B350 if you want to go back in time a little bit, or even a 450 like the one I'm uh, reviewing here, which is from uh, Biostar. Uh, that's not that one, that's a different one. I'm actually reviewing two, uh, two uh, B450s at the moment. Yes, we've got a lot of reviews in the pipeline. Anyway, uh, moving on to the next piece of news, and this one's actually IPC gains. And just to clarify, this is referring to Zen 2. So we all saw the next Horizon event, and there was a lot of information that AMD did provide us. Clock speeds were one thing they didn't give out. Um, we can probably say that 4.5 to 4.8 gigahertz is going to be the clock speeds they achieve. We base this upon what we know the 7NM node is capable of, uh, as well as a couple of slides regarding uh, the performance that did emerge from the event, although obviously they're rather tentative. The second uh, reason is because we have seen some leaks concerning around 4.5 to 4.8 is supposedly what AMD are getting the engineering sample processes up internally, but obviously A, that's a rumor, and B, that is engineering samples, so the retails could either be slower, faster, or that speed. But if you remember when AMD moved to the original Zen architecture, they were aiming at like 40% IPC improvement from the older generation. So what they actually achieved, of course, was 52%, which was drastic. It was huge over pile driver and excavator. It was a massive gargantuan leap. And yes, Zen 2, sorry, the original Zen did have a couple of issues, uh, primarily when it was released. The biggest problem was that some software just wasn't optimized for, for it, gosh darn it. And we actually tested that. We showed that, for example, Rise of the Tomb Raider with subsequent patches and Ashes of the Singularity had massive performance uh, jumps when the developers patched it. And it was, it was tangible, like just a couple of uh, patches and it was like the performance went from there to there. It was just ridiculous. But obviously now developers have kind of gotten a handle on things and uh, new game engines and new uh, games are uh, released with Ryzen in mind. They've, they've uh, figured out how to optimize at least some degree and AMD worked with developers. But that's now, that's Zen and Zen Plus bought like a 3% IPC-ish from Zen to Zen Plus. And primarily they did that through the ability to reduce uh, cache latency. And so if one processor core needed to access data that was in another processor core's uh, cache, it would just be considerably faster. There'll be less latency there. And it was also faster going from one CCX to the other CCX. So in other words, it was a marginal increase in performance for IPC, but that combined with high clock speeds equals good times. But AMD themselves actually did provide information of how much faster Zen 2 is supposedly gonna be over the original Zen architecture. In footnotes of an article that they published on the next day of the Next Horizon event, they claim that we see a 29% increase in IPC when comparing Zen 2 to Zen 1. I'm assuming that's the original Zen, not Zen Plus, because it sounds more impressive that way. And this is, quote, in combined floating point and integer benchmarks. So these, of course, uh, when you, uh, uh, measuring this, this would be under flops. Now, there's a couple of points that we need to immediately take away. One is floating point. AMD gave a lot of information concerning floating point performance. It was one of the things that they did tout as a major increase in performance. They basically drastically increased the throughput uh, through floating point, but by drastically, they doubled floating point performance. Uh, with the processors, but that is combined with lots of other stuff. Improved branch prediction, improved instruction prefetch, increased bandwidth across the chips. 
Uh, there are rumours as well we see increased uh, cash sizes, especially level 3 cash, although that has not been 100% confirmed yet. There are some rumours that tell us it might have double the cash on level 3. There are some rumours it says it has more. But either way, the fact of the matter is that overall the processes are considerably faster. Now this is not the video to really start delving deep into what a floating point unit does and what integer unit does and how all of those aspects of the process of work. I have done those videos in the past and there will be a deeper in-depth architecture analysis of Zen over the next several days. But what we can say about this is that most likely the 29% that's Let's call it uh, basically 30% IPC gains are not necessarily going to be in all operations. The key there is it was floating point combined arithmetic. So if it is a game that does not necessarily require high precision floating point calculations, it's not going to be like that. There are other rumours that tell us that the IPC gains are on average AMD have managed to wrangle up the process is around 12 to 15%. That is not bad. I mean, let's, for the sake of this video, call it 12%. Let's be quite cautious and say it's 12% in standard integer and most operations. Obviously, this will depend upon the application. So, for example, Blender might have a different performance advantage than, let's say, Premiere or Photoshop or one operation in Photoshop, one filter might give a completely different result to another filter or one game engine let's call it unreal engine might benefit more than let's say the source engine or it might benefit more than let's say the unity engine i don't want to keep going over old ground i think you get where i'm going with this so obviously this will be application specific and it will also mean that certain applications perhaps applications which really push avx instructions so for example cinebench type of uh benchmarks they might go up quite drastically certain games might also improve uh, improve in performance as well uh, because obviously this is still somewhat um <laughs> it, it, it's kind of vague is what i'm going with this but it does tell us that in the best case scenario we're going to be looking at around 12 percent if the rumors are accurate 12 percent ipc to 30 percent ipc improvements and some might call that not bad i would call that bloody good that is, that is terrific to me. That is really, that is impressive. It's a much bigger leap than, of course, Zen to Zenpos, but it's also a way bigger leap than what uh, Intel have managed to do since, well, a long ass time. Uh, when Sandy Bridge was released, Sandy Bridge to Ivy Bridge to Haswell, there were IPC gains to be had there, but let's face it, most of it was down to either improved processes. I'm, I'm saying, like, from Sandy all the way to, let's say, even KB Lake or Coffee Lake. Yes, there are some IPC gains there. We've seen some improvements because of DDR4's introduction and improved memory controllers and all of that stuff. But in terms of generational leaps, this is absolutely huge. And it should be quite gargantuan when we see it in action. Obviously, still early days. The fact that AMD did tell us this tells us it's not necessarily a pipe dream, but it does mean that 29% is most likely the best case scenarios if all of the stars align. But even so, let's say the rumors are accurate, 12 to 15%, which I don't think is unreasonable. Once again, given all of the information we've learned about what AMD are doing with the chips, so 12 to let's say 30% is really impressive compared, uh, so combine that with a modest clock speed increase. I also want to go into a couple of pieces of Xbox news as well. Microsoft have just confirmed that they have purchased NXile as well as Obsidian Studios. These rumours have actually been floating around for a while. I believe it was Kotaku who originally told us that Microsoft were looking into purchase of uh, Obsidian. And obviously, these are two major studios. Um, Pillars of Eternity has gone down absolutely amazingly well with critics, and it is, it is genuinely a really good series of games. I've not really played huge amounts of it. I'm starting to kind of uh, jump into it recently because I really just like, you know, those type of RPGs, and it's just been ages since I've played them. So they have a really good pedigree. Just looking at the titles that Obsidian have created, so they are not, of course, the only studios that Microsoft have acquired. They've really been stepping up the game. They've just been buying out studios left and right. It's going to be fascinating to me exactly what Microsoft are going to have them work on. Supposedly, if you believe Microsoft and the studios in question, I refer to all of the studios here, 
they are still given an awful lot of creative freedom. So theoretically, you're not going to have them strangle, be strangle held by Microsoft into doing certain things. And I really hope that's the case. What I'm hoping for here is a best case scenario where the studios are basically get to make the games they want, which is what Microsoft are telling us, but they just don't have to worry necessarily about, well, uh, if this game doesn't sell like this number of copies, uh, everyone can just pack up and we have to go home because we're broke. So I'm hoping they get that backing. It does mean, of course, that we now have exclusivity there. So games will most likely appear just on the Xbox and the PC. Goodness knows whether, whether we're going to see any releases on the PlayStation and other consoles. Probably not from those studios, let's just be honest. Which means I believe it was Wasteland 3 had been confirmed for the PlayStation 4. So I'm guessing that's no longer on the table. We also have confirmation that Microsoft and Razer, who are working together on keyboard and mouse, specifically, of course, for the Xbox platform, will be unveiling them at CES 2019. And games such as Fortnite will indeed have support for keyboard and mouse, which makes it quite interesting how companies are going to be really supporting this. It does also show us that Microsoft are really keen to just push the Xbox platform. Microsoft wrote, and I quote, Additionally, we shared that the best uh, mouse and keyboard experience on the Xbox One will be available through designed for Xbox and mice keyboards. These are created for living room or desktop scenarios, come combined with a dedicated Xbox key, and support new Xbox dynamic lighting feature, enabling immersive in-game lighting effects. In addition to that, we saw Crackdown 3, which is announced for Game Pass, and that's going to launch in February 15th. That will also be debuting with the uh, Wrecking Zone multiplayer. By the way, the original Crackdown is going to be free, uh, at least for the short term, uh, freely available to download from uh, on Xbox, so if you want to check out the original Crackdown, now's the time to grab it. Uh, it's Microsoft are having a massive uh, sale with Black Friday deals. Microsoft also unveiled Forza Horizon DLC, State of Decay uh, updates, and so much more besides, as well as uh, various trailers and information from third-party developers. So we got new Devil May Cry stuff, we saw new trailers for Kingdom Hearts, and so much more. So basically, Microsoft really hammered home that conference. I think they kind of realize that this generation of systems, they're not going to catch up with Sony. We all know that. That's not the concern anymore. What they are trying to do, as they've said themselves, is really set up for the next generation and to make sure that people who do own an Xbox One right now are not disappointed. We're going to be in for a treat, I think, for the next generation. I think that Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo are going to be bringing their A game. And this is really good news, even for PC gamers, because, well, it just gives us more platforms to choose from, more games, and that is only a good thing. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. If you did, if you can click the like button, well, that would just be gosh darn amazing because, well, it really helps out the channel. You can also click the subscribe button as well because that means you get more of me, which I don't know why you wouldn't want that. Oh, and if you want a funny story for today, and by funny, I don't mean haha, I mean like Paul going into the corner and crying for a little bit. I had actually wrote an entire script, <laughs> uh, put out a video. So there was actually two videos planned. One, which was uh, IPC performance testing, which will be coming out. I can't reveal more about that until probably tomorrow it'll be finished at this rate, maybe the day after, because I have to do refilming now. Because I'd scripted that video, and then there was a second follow-up video, which was going into the whole Zen 2 architecture and what AMD were planning. But now that we have this IPC information, it means I really need to film like half of that video again and rewrite like a third of the other script. So, you know, that wasn't like, you know, making me go into a corner and cry or anything like that. That's, that's the important thing. Anyway, uh, with all of that said, hopefully you had a great day and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Take care of yourselves and bye for now.